Roger Gimlin and Robert Bob Patterson were two men who lived in Townsville during the late 1800s. Both men vanished without a trace whilst out on a hunting trip during an inconspicuous summer's day in 1891. The following is a historical account of what transpired on the day of their disappearance. They foraged around, some fifty yards or so below their watch on the granite bluff. A mob, a dozen in number. Occasionally one would cease its grazing and stand upright for a moment, scanning the environ for any sign of danger. The hunters were strategically positioned so as to be upwind of the animals. There was little chance of them being detected. After carefully scanning each animal through the lens of the telescope, Gimlin selected his target. Third from the right. A fine specimen, he was a well-fed buck. In the prime of his life. He gestured his preference to his partner. He carefully removed the boot from his left foot and positioned it on the rock in front of him. He then retrieved his rifle. It was a Henry, its fine American walnut stock looking somewhat glazed against the morning light. He removed his hat and positioned the piece upon the boot. Cool wind coming in from the east. He slowed down his breathing, looked down the sights, and gently squeezed the trigger. The shot rang out through the valley. All the animals bounded from the clearing, save one. Well, I guess you weren't lying. Bob said. Roger swung the lever of the rifle and ejected the empty cartridge, grinning slightly. They didn't call me the terror of Tennessee for nothing. Come on, let's go down there and go get him then. Upon inspecting the kill, Patterson whistled loudly. Well, I've got to say it to you, mate. I thought you had Buckley's chance of hitting that boomer. Well, call me Mavis. Straight through the bloody head. Old boy here was dead before he could figure out which Jill to root tonight. Gimlin turned and smirked at Patterson. Well, I suppose there's not a great deal else for a buck like him to consider out here. Truth be told, I was aiming for the neck. It's a bit sloppy. Oh well, I suppose we can be our own harshest judges at times. Patterson kicked at the recently departed kangaroo's great muscled legs. You said it, mate. I never doubt the weapon, though. It's seen me through essentially every predicament a man can lend his imaginings to. Yankees, Indians, game, you name it. Old Lizzie has likely put it in the ground. Lizzie, why'd you take to naming your gun after a Sheila? Because she's been more true to me than any woman ever has. I'll tell you that much. During the war, our regiment was tasked with defending this rise outside of Chattanooga. I was the top rifle of the unit, so they bestowed upon me this self-same weapon. I sent wave after wave of Yankee bastards tumbling back over the hill. It got so bad that eventually Grant himself was forced to redirect artillery fire to blast us out. They took it eventually, but we made them bleed for every yard of ground. Bob continued to toy with the dead animal. Is that why you came out here, mate, to get away from your past? Roger turned and spat in the grass. Somewhat. They'd be liable to hang me in the north for some of the things I'd done. Shit. I even heard rumors of bounty hunters on my heels like the very hounds of hell. Besides, the place is soft as a sow's belly now. Damn bleeding hearts. Bob had begun to withdraw a length of rope from his rucksack. Well, I could never quite wrap my noggin around that. A country at war with itself. I couldn't think of something like that happening here. Well, you never know. The good old U.S. of A went to war over tea once. You're never liable to know what'll tip good people over the edge. Bob nodded in silent agreement, and both men began preparing the carcass for transportation back to camp. The men trudged up the hill, carrying the kangaroo between them on a length of iron bark, its hands and feet tied at the top of the timber. They approached the makeshift corral where the horses were tied. Groaning, they lowered the branch and stood clutching at their backs. I'm too old for this shit. Ah, uh, you'll be right, chief. Just need to get some tea into you. I'll put the kettle on for a final cuppa before we set out. I shall not decline such an offer. As Bob said about fixing the tea, a peculiar noise pierced the otherwise silent air. It sounded somewhat like wonk. 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 Distant, 
but close enough to cause concern. The horses murmured slightly and moved about. It was unlike anything either man had heard before, and its sudden appearance was met with likewise confusion. What do you suppose that was? Christ, I wouldn't be able to tell you, mate. I've never heard of such a noise in all my life. Gimlin paused for a moment and thought. It must have been that gunshot. A bat in China could have heard that. My reckoning is that that noise was created by a bull roarer, an instrument of sorts devised by the savages to make their enemies soil their britches. Some men I rode with back in Nebraska said the Plains Indians used them prolifically. They might be preparing a war party, or it's a ruse. Either way, we ought to depart at once. Tea's the last thing on my mind now, mate, I can assure you of that. Before long, the only trace of their existence on that field were smoking embers from the fire as they saddled up and rode out for Townsville at a canter through the twisted and anguished trees. After an hour or so of riding the pair slowed their pace to a trot, each man inconspicuously concealing his relief that they had escaped a potential ambush. Patterson was the first to openly exude his bravado. Well, I reckon I'll be taking my earnings down to the pub when we get home. I'll be keen to check out some of the local wildlife. What do you reckon, Rog? Gimlin turned in the saddle and attempted to shoo away a column of flies that had descended upon him since they slowed. Sounds like a tempting offer there, lad, but I'm resigned to the fact that my days of debauchery are over now. I'll most probably return to my readings. Patterson scoffed. Sounds like a highly entertaining evening. Do you not get lonely out there on your property? There's much more to do in town, and I've seen your wares when I come around for work. Something tells me it's not like you can't afford it. Gimlin smiled slightly. Son, when you're as old as I am and seen the things I've seen, you gain a true appreciation for the degenerative capacity of mankind. Now I'm no saint by any means, but I have looked into the eye of evil incarnate more times than I care to count. Such evil resides in every man and woman, whether they know it or not. Once I realized that, I decided it would be wise to make myself scarce from society. In short, I only ever get lonely around people. Lizzie, my animals and sassy here is all the company I need. Forgetting anything. He thought for a moment. Of course, how could I forget? That fellow that came by to help me with the fence when you had fever. John? Or was it Jack? Anywho, he was a good lad. Very handy. Patterson shook his head in disbelief. Cheeky old bugger. Before long they arrived at the Malva Canyon. Both men reined in their horses. Gimlin reached for one of his kit bags and retrieved the map. After studying it carefully for a moment he spoke. Well it seems as though we made a wrong turn about five miles back. But no matter. This here gulch acts as a shortcut of sorts. If we follow it up, it'll put us back on the right course. Bob nodded in agreement and they resumed their journey. The horses made their way up the creek bed as delicately as if they were walking on eggshells. Acacia and eucalypt lining the walls of the canyon. The stones upon which they trod were round and smooth, as if they had been polished by a mason. Suddenly, Patterson raised a hand and brought the procession to a halt. He pointed out with his left hand. Crikey, what do you suppose that is? Gimlin reviewed the images painted on the canyon wall. Well, I'd wager it to be the artist's imagining of some manner of spirit creature. It looks familiar to an animal some of the natives back in the state spoke of. Wild men that live in the hills and are covered all over in hair. Bunch of superstitious bullpucky though. It isn't of no concern to the civilized man. Patterson continued to survey the tableau. This creature is attacking the natives, tearing them to shreds. There's no animal around here capable of doing that. Do you reckon it's some kind of warning? Well, like I told you, it's based on myth. Just savage storytelling and other nonsense. Perhaps the tale was inspired by an ornery uncle that forgot to shave. Anyhow, daylight's burning, lad. We need to keep on. You lead on, mate. I'll just be a tick. Suit yourself. It's all nonsense, though. He turned and continued up the creek. Patterson surveyed the painting for a few moments more. 
He turned around and looked behind him and then continued on to catch up with Gimlin. It was mid-afternoon. The ghostly shadows cast by the trees were beginning to envelop the travelers. A low, droning wonk. Wonk, wonk, made its way down the length of the canyon. Jesus, that came from behind us, Rudge. I thought we had outfoxed them. Must be a different group. They most likely saw us come down into the gulch from the canyon wall. No matter, if they're feeling froggy, I'll acquaint them with Lizzie. You keep that six-shooter I gave you handy now, too, boy. If they want a scrap, we'll give them one. I'll unload at them from a distance. You keep watch of our flank and ensure that they don't sneak up on us. You got it, mate. Well, all right then, let's keep going. Around a bend in the creek, the men came to face a rock wall in front of them. Wonk! 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 They are getting closer now, Rudge. That's all right, son. This works to our favor anyway. Means we can't be attacked from the rear. See that granite boulder over yonder? That's where we'll make our Alamo, a clear line of sight down the corridor. Once they turn that bend, it'll be a turkey shoot. I'll wait until they close the distance to about 30 yards. There's a rock wall on our right flank, so you just need to cover the left. Let's hitch the horses and hide our gear. After some minutes of waiting atop the boulder, their pursuers emerged from around the bend in the creek. Three indigenous men came sprinting at full stride, waving their arms aloft, shouting hysterically. Heck, these guys really are agitated. We must have kicked over some sacred stick or something. Gimlin muttered to himself. Once they closed the gap, Gimlin signaled to Patterson, who was crouching beside the boulder, overlooking the left flank. Gimlin fired three shots in rapid succession. By the time the third man had realized what was happening, he attempted to turn and break right for the tree line, but could only manage a few paces before he too was felled. They waited a few more minutes to see if any more would appear, but none did. Well, that was queer. Patterson said, breaking the silence as they moved over to inspect the bodies. If they wanted to drive us out of here, why didn't they come in force? Perhaps they knew such would be a fool's errand. They seen we was armed, so they sent these crazies up to try and spook us. Hey, Rog, these blokes here aren't armed. No hidden knives or anything. There's nothing on them but their crutch cloths. A piercing wonk. 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 Enveloped the canyon. The horses began baying and kicking about violently. Christ, oh Christ. They weren't trying to attack us, Rog. They were trying to warn us. Gimlin looked at him as if he were mad. Warn us of what? That creature we saw back on the wall. Don't go loony on me now, boy. I told you that was nonsense. It's just them savages trying to spook us, and by the looks of it, it's working a treat on you. Either way, let's get the hell out of here. The noise emerged again, sounding quite close now. You're correct. I've lost the desire to quarrel. Besides, we've wasted enough time here. Ready our gear and the horses. I'll keep watch from this position. As Patterson turned to prepare their departure, he heard a phrase pass from Gimlin's lips that he only ever used if they were in serious trouble. Good God Almighty. Patterson looked back and saw the beast make the turn and amble up the corridor. It was an enormous, living representative of the figure in the painting. It stood in the creek bed some fifty yards away from Gimlin. You prepare your own horse and gear. Gimlin instructed, his eyes still fixated on the great beast. I'm going to drive a couple rounds through this ugly son of a bitch and bring his head back to town. Go on now, son. Patterson turned to look at Gimlin, then the beast, then Gimlin again. You always did have balls of steel, Rog. It's been an honor working with you. Likewise, Bob. It's been a pleasure. Now go on, kid. Patterson turned and made a break for the horses. He wasted no time in unfastening the hitch and cut away all unnecessary items that were tied to the animal. As he broke off and rode through the trees, he heard shots ring out from the creek bed as the guttural wonk, wonk, wonks, descended upon Gimlin. He leaned up against the tree, deathly tired. 
His horse had died from exhaustion a day ago. Hopelessly lost in this manic sea of granite and ironbark. In his attempt to flee he had neglected to retrieve the map from Gimlin's rucksack. The creature had pursued him over hill and dale, relentless in its quest to devour him. He had shot it several times in vain. Nothing slowed it down. Wonk! 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 It approached him again. He could hardly move. He shuffled forward in vain. There would be no outrunning at this time. The footsteps were falling heavily behind him. He could swear he heard it laughing. He managed to force himself over to the cliffside. He looked down. It must have been some 80 yards to the trees below. He looked back toward the wood from whence he had emerged. The trees were rocked by its passage. He had some moments to decide, maybe no moments at all. Stay here and certainly perish, or take a leap of faith and pray for at worst, a few broken bones. He rattled such thoughts around in his mind as the creature appeared from the forest and closed in.